welcome to the Ghosts of Harrenhal. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 162 of our chapter by chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we're discussing chapter 18 of A Storm of Swords. We're staying north of the wall, but not with Jon Snow. This is Sam Wan. Sam? How exciting! And as always, we're going to chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you. And hopefully we're going to provide you some entertainment along the way. We'll summarise what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. And we got some very nice listener correspondence today. I'm very excited about that one. We Um, did. Be sure to check out the show notes. Additional information about the characters and geography of this chapter. Uh, Particularly helpful if you're not following along. How are you, McKelly? I am doing very well, in fact. I see our witty banter is blank, but that's okay. We can <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we can fill the time. Um, I am doing quite well. I just came from dinner. I was, was a few minutes late getting down here to record because I just come from dinner with my core nuclear family, and it is um, it's just rare these days because you know Ethan lives two and a half three hours away, and Molly's always busy with some either school or some sort of acting production type deal and so it's just it's just you know when you as your kids get older and your family gets busier it's just so nice to go out to eat together just the four of you well i'm sorry for rushing you i feel bad about that now no no i was back i even had time to shower before we recorded so i am good how about you how are you doing i'm I'm fine i'm fine you you are you are relentlessly sentimental, McKelly. I, have to say. I know it's it's a problem. It's really a problem. <laughs> I mean, we 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 were clearing our house of stuff the other day, and neither Carson nor I have just a grain of sentiment in us. It's just like <laughs> oh man. picture that Lucas drew when he was three, like <laughs> trash. <laughs> <laughs> it's poorly done. <laughs> yeah. What's this even supposed to be? (laughs) Oh, and then here I am. So I've cleaned out the garage multiple times over the years. And each time I've thrown away some stuff that was sentimental to me and kept some items that like the hockey sticks that Ethan and I used to play with when he was little or a set of dodgeballs that that we all used to play with when the kids were younger. And, you know, I little t-ball bats and and things like that and i would keep them in the corner and then this spring i mean ethan's 22 and molly's 16 or this fall rather uh, a few weeks ago i was cleaning out the garage and i put it all in the garbage and the garbage didn't go out to the next day like uh you know so it was sitting out there and no joke i woke up in the middle of the night and thought i need to go get that stuff back out (laughs) How could I part with the hockey stick that Ethan used when he was six? <laughs> but Stacy, she said, I was like, should I go back out and get that stuff? She goes, if you do, I'm going to punch you. <laughs> <laughs> She's cut much more from your cloth than mine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I rarely, well, not not rarely, but I don't always have common cause with Stacy. But on this one, I'm with her 100%. <laughs> yes. Stuff's got to go. Oh, uh, it went. It went. That was a few weeks ago. It's sitting in the dump somewhere. So, um, I, I showed you just before we started that I've painted the inside of my fireplace. Um, and you, yes. when you paint the inside of your fireplace, I mean, you don't have to do this, but if you intend to light fires in there, you need to get <laughs> heat-resistant paint because yes. otherwise... I see work. some logic in that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, that's happened today. That stuff stinks. Like oh. you would not believe the I... house. It smells oh. like someone has just like exploded a blue cheese all over the house. It is <laughs> blue appalling. <cheese. laughs> oh my god! Well, I do enjoy blue cheese, but I'm not sure that I would like the smell of it. Uh, Love blue cheese myself, but yes, it's a little overpowering. This one, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know. I, I can't say I've ever painted the inside of a fireplace, so I have it's, not had the pleasure. It's a very singular thing to do. Um, not many would take it on. But there you are. Well, 
that makes me sound like I'm the kind of person who takes on challenging uh, household uh, it does, things. It but does, I am yes. not. <laughs> this is something that I've thought about for a year and finally gotten round to. That's more me. That's more the way I operate. Well, I appreciate the ambition. <laughs> well, so Ethan is in town because uh, tomorrow morning, Stacy and I are headed to the mountains for four days. So Ethan's in town because he's keeping an eye on the house and Molly and the dog. Okay. Which, so, yeah, so that should be... Doesn't he have a job these days? He does, but he works remotely, so he... Oh, so he can... Yeah, he came in yes last night, and uh, he worked today here, and he'll work tomor- tomorrow here and Monday here. Kids today. I know. They've got it made. <laughs> Although they have to deal with social media. I'm kind of glad we didn't have that in our oh. day. Uh, yeah, it would have been awful. I mean, it really uh, would have been awful. Yes, yes. It would have changed life so much. Yeah. I mean, I think about how self-conscious I was about everything in my when I was a teenager. And then just like, uh-huh. imagine it being just amplified and broadcast to the world all the time. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm not upset we didn't have cell phones in our day. Because there's something about being out of pocket, you know? Yeah, yeah. Plus... I, I I know we've had this discussion before. I'm not sure we did it on the podcast, but but fiction is more interesting without cell phones. The the presence of cell phones takes away a lot of drama from. Situations. Yes, yes, it does. Sometimes you know when you're reading a book that took place and even as early as the mid '90s, you think, well, if they just had a cell phone, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this would be over without any. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was talking to my friend Tim the other day, and. Uh, he is a good friend and I enjoy his company. He has an interesting uh, vocal tick that he that he uses unknowingly all the time. And I, I actually, I decided to bring it to his attention because I thought it was interesting to see his reaction to this. Uh-huh. When he punched you, is that that's the black eye? I see. <laughs> <laughs> when you're explaining something to Tim, he, instead of. In, in the sort of like, in the gaps between your speech, when you might expect someone to say, uh-huh, or okay, he says, correct. Oh. As if he already knew what you're explaining <laughs> <Right>. to him. <laughs> right. He's wanting you to know, this is nothing new to me. <laughs> <laughs> Even when it patently is, <laughs> he says, correct. And he laughed when I told him, and he, he was like, oh, that's funny, I, I don't think I've ever noticed that. And he said the very next day at work, somebody was telling him something that he didn't have any clue about, and he said, correct, he was like, oh my god, I do, <laughs> I do, do that. <laughs> <laughs> so he's basically an unknowing know-it-all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the thing is, it doesn't come across like that when you're having a conversation. The first time he does it, you're like, huh? But then he just does it all the time, and you're like, oh, he's just, that's just his vocal sort of like connective right. tissue. You know, he says, Going like, right. Or, he he yeah. came back with his own son. He His own son's tick like that is, dad, two things. Or, dad, three things. <laughs> he always yeah. starts with the number of things he's going to tell you. <laughs> And he said, he said, I swear it's so, because he wants you to pay attention, because he knows your attention's going to dwindle after the first <laughs> <Right>. one. <laughs> so you've got to count, you've got to keep, keep a tally, you have to keep. That's a good there. idea. I should try that. <laughs> All right. Let's get down to business. How did we leave Samuel Tarley? I mean, we did leave him. He wasn't a POV character at the time, but we did leave him. So last we saw of Sam was it back in Chet's prologue. So we've had a long wait for him. Um, where Sam was within a hair's breadth of getting skewered until he was saved by three blasts of the Night's Watch horn. Um, But that, of course, signals others, so it's not all good news. Um, Or, of course, it could mean that three different Night Watch parties are returning at the same time, (laughs) as we've discussed. (laughs) McKelly, why don't we give the summary of this one? Okay, this is going to be fun. Sam takes a step, then another then another, and so on. It sounds simple enough, but it's not. He's been marching through snow with drifts up to his knees nonstop. Lord Commander Mormont has set the remaining men of the Night's Watch on a forced march away from the Fist of the First Men. Sam doesn't know how much longer he can go. He sobs uncontrollably, but he steps. One foot, then the other. As much as he wants to start walking, he knows he can't. He stops, he dies. 
All the men know this. What men are left? Uh, the fifty who survived the fight on the fist have dwindled. Some died from injuries, other men simply disappearing. They're behind them, the men also know this, taking their brothers one by one. Despite many layers of clothes, Sam is so cold. All around he can see flames moving in the distance, a ring of torches around the men, keeping them safe from what lurks on the other side. He prays to the mother for mercy, but he knows the seven hold no power north of the wall. He's reminded of Maslin, who begged fruitlessly for mercy from a white, only to have his neck snapped by the ruthless dead with cold blue eyes. Sobbing, exhausted, frozen, Sam trips over a root and falls. A feeble effort to get back up is unsuccessful, so he lies in the snow and accepts his fate. Dying won't be so bad, and he won't be the first. Hundreds died on the fist. No, he'll lay here, rest a little, and die a little. He's done his duty, and nobody can take that away. Mormont told him to stay out of the way and send ravens if things went badly. It did, and he did. Things went very badly. If only he'd been braver, stronger, less craven. He was such a craven. His father shipped him away and made his brother heir. But it's all over now. When the horns blew those terrible three blasts, Sam woke to find only Chet in the area. The man was terrified and immediately ran off. Sam got the birds off to Castle Black and to the Shadow Tower, then packed his belongings, including the dragon glass arrows and spearheads John had found. Sam watches as men loosed arrows into the oncoming enemy. The direct hits did little to stop their advance. Lord Commander Mormont commanded the men to use fire arrows, and Sam to write up an account of the events to send with additional birds. Sam's narrative drafts went from the positive to the utterly hopeless, as the undead army breached the ring wall, arrows in their faces and through their throats. Sam's last line, the battle's lost, we're all lost. Unfortunately, when the call to horse went up, Sam let the remaining birds free, only he forgot to attach any of the letters to them. Whoops. Sam's bladder had let go at the sight of a white run through with the spear, twist a brother's head around. Sam ran to the central fire where he mounted the nearest horse and joined the spearhead led by Commander Mormont. Sam watched as a hairless dead bear ripped the head off Thorin Smallwood before kicking his mount into action. The brothers flew down the south slope while whites pulled men and horses down with clutching black hands. Sam allowed himself a moment's relief when they reached the forest, but at that moment a man in black leapt from the tree onto Sam's horse, knocking Sam off. Dolorous Ed found him and pulled Sam onto Ed's horse. Mormont redistributed the supplies and injured men across the horses, forcing most men to travel on foot. But not Sam. Not now. Maybe if he rests for a bit. Gretton suddenly looms over him, shouting for Sam to get up. He tries to drag Sam to his feet, but Sam won't help, and he's too heavy for Gren to hold him upright. Other brothers pass by, urging Gren to leave him. Only small Paul stops to help. The huge man hands Gren his torch and scoops Sam up like a baby. Paul carries Sam for a while. All he asks in return is that Sam give him a talking raven like Mormont's. By the way, at the wedding there were two guys called Paul, and one was known as Tall Paul. Even though he was uh -huh. French. I mean, that's kind of an English term to say tall Paul, but he was known as tall Paul. Weirdly, the shorter of the two. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually, even Paul tires and sets Sam in the snow. Gren realizes they're all alone. The last of the rear guard pass them by. Their only light comes from the torch Gren holds. Thankfully, a horse's head emerges from the darkness, but the relief is only momentary. Hoarfrost covers the animal and its entrails drag behind it. Probably not a healthy horse at this point. No. Mm -mm. Uh, its pale rider slides silently from the saddle. It's no white. In a blink, the sword of the slim, graceful other slashes Gren's torch in two, the fire extinguishing in the snow. Paul charges it with his axe. The crystal sword slips easily through Paul's body and out the other side. Paul's falling body pulls the sword from the other's hand. In that moment, Sam stumbles forward and drives the dragon glass dagger into the other. There's a crack like ice breaking... Then the monster starts to melt until nothing remains. You might think we scripted this. That we planned this episode to happen the week of Halloween. But really, it was just blind luck that this episode happened to come up this week. If, if you heard all the edits that went into getting that uh, recap together, you would not think that we scripted this. <laughs> <laughs> but you would think it was a horror show. <laughs> <laughs> You'd think we were just making it up as we went along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wrote this really late at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, because this is the real, this is the first real monsters in this show. I mean, in, in this show. Are we, are we reading a show or are we reading a book, McKelly? Which one is it? Um, I... Most times a book. Most it's a book, time... okay, a book. Yes. Do, do like um, charades, yeah? Like a book. Yeah, remind yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, because, I mean, we, we saw them very briefly in the prologue of Game of Thrones, but we haven't seen them since. And pretty much everything else has been, well, I guess there's been, I, that's Melisande's love child was a little bit monstrous. It, w- it was. And dragons, I suppose, are a little bit monstrous. They, but... they are. They're, they're a little small, though, to be that's true. overly intimidating. But yeah, we've seen a handful of whites, but this is the first time we've seen whites in mass. Yeah, and yeah. then an other appear yes, in yes. a long time. So. so it's great that we've got Sam as a POV. I think we all like Sam. He's relatable. I mean, he's certainly relatable to me because I'd be absolutely terrified living in this world, you know, and so. Yeah, although uh, his lack of self-confidence, I'm not sure, would be very relatable to you. (laughs) I see what you're saying there. I can fake lack of self-confidence if you need. (laughs) I'm sure you can if necessary, yes. (laughs) Better than most people, let me tell you. (laughs) (laughs) I could do it the best. (laughs) But, you know, whereas like John's Night's Watch story has been about him rising through the ranks by proving himself while also doing immature things that get him in trouble, only to find a wise mentor to steer him straight. Often Sam. Yeah. (laughs) Sam's, at least, you know, this introduction into Sam's mind is all about self-doubt and failure and being looked down upon by pretty much everybody. But yet, what he doesn't what he doesn't recognize is that when the moment came, he rose to the challenge. Unlike so many of his other brothers, like for instance, uh, we mentioned in the we didn't mention him by name, but the uh, the brother who tried to beg for mercy to the white, who ended up getting his head his neck broken, or however he died. Uh, Sam, Sam. Char- charged into another with a dagger. He did his job. He hung in there. He did what he needed to do. I, I will say, though, that um, uh, Paul, small Paul, might have a different um, attitude to Sam's <laughs> behavior in this because he, Good he's Good dead <laughs> because he carried Sam, you know. That, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. But but yeah, I mean he did. I mean he he he's he has tried to do his duty throughout this chapter, you know, to the best of his ability. Yeah. Um it was it was smart of him to sort of write the messages out ahead of time. Although it does kind of go to what's the point really? I mean, if you if you're overwhelmed at the fist of the first man by white walkers, then any message back is enough. White walkers attacked us, you know. If you come home, we know you survive. If you didn't, we know you didn't survive. And either way, we know there are White Walkers up and about north of the wall. Yeah, unfortunately, that's the message he didn't get he out. failed to send. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he sent the one that they were being attacked. He did not send the one about White Walkers attacking them. But yes, you're right. As long as one person physically makes it back. Or one raven with a message. Yes, right. Either of those would do it. But do you think his elevation to the... POV ranks here in A Song of Ice and Fire means that we're gonna there's gonna be more importance placed on the Night's Watch and dealings with wildlings and others now that we've kind of broken the seal here with seeing an actual other and a big attack by a large force of whites. Yeah, maybe maybe it portends that John is going to go, you know, I think they the end of the last John chapter, they were headed south of the wall right so maybe we're losing the north of the wall perspective and that's what we need sam for okay but but yeah i mean okay yeah they're active participants in the book now and also i think you're right about john and i think to take that one step further john is currently disconnected from the night's watch so now with sam's pov we're placed back into the fold of the yeah yeah black brothers yeah so but also i mean in in many respects, his moment just came. I mean, he, um, it seems like he's the first person that we know of to have killed an, a White Walker, right? Right. The Fist of the First Men, what he remembers were clearly whites attacking the people and they were repelled by fire, 
you know, but that was about it. Some of them were killed, right. but they were just right. whites. I mean, John has already done that once, yeah? But he's the first person we've got sort of documentary evidence that he killed a white walker. So this is uh, this is newsworthy, and, and basically Sam has cemented his place in the story. He's done something that perhaps others can learn from. And I mean others with a small O in this case. Right. Although the others with a big O might learn from it too. <laughs> they might too. They'll make adjustments as well. <laughs> exactly. But So we opened A Storm of Swords, as you mentioned, with the Chet prologue where he was planning a mutiny and then the then had the realization that others were approaching. And I gotta say, it's it, it's it's been a while for the, the payoff for that cliffhanger. It's been 17 chapters yeah. between the prologue and this chapter that we were waiting to see what's going to happen now. But also, you know, Sam thinks himself, he, he refers to himself as the biggest coward in the Seven Kingdoms. Yet, speaking of Chet in that prologue, Chet soiled his pants as well, and he ran off, whereas Sam stayed to do his job, so... Well, did Chet run off? I I wasn't 100% sure about that. I thought Chet ran off from his self-appointed mission to kill Sam. He did. I thought perhaps he ran off to do his duty. It could be. It could be. It doesn't sound like Chet. Right. Yes, exactly. It really doesn't. (laughs) But we don't know what he ran off to do, I guess. But um, remember, he had given up on the mutiny plot because it started snowing. And then he thought, well, I'm just going to kill Sam Tarly then. But then on his way to do it, when he was thinking in his head, imagining how Sam was going to soil his small clothes. Uh, And then Chet heard the three blasts and soiled his own small clothes. Right. That does all come back to me now. But he was right in some respects because Sam has, later on in the chapter, has peed his pants. He was right, yes. Um, It's funny that Sam, actually completely oblivious to the assassination attempt he saw chet ne- never thought anything of it he was like oh morning chet do you hear that <laughs> right three blasts <laughs> was that three <laughs> what's with your pants <laughs> <laughs> so, so to be fair to the white walkers you know i mean they may be misunderstood um <laughs> they actually saved sam's life and how did he repay them he used a dragon glass dagger to kill one of them <laughs> i tell you it's the un- the injustice of it all. <laughs> the others driving what remains of the Great Ranging kind of relentlessly onward it is surely the primary issue in this chapter. But the the secondary issue in this chapter is all about Sam's feelings about himself. Well, yeah, I mean... Obviously, the whole thing is a, just one long near-death experience. You know, I mean, if you're marching through knee-deep snow and you're carrying a ton of stuff and you're 200 pounds overweight, then you're not thinking that this is going to end well. <laughs> and so <laughs> a little self-reflection is sort of like inevitable in this time, I would think. And Sam's yeah, yeah. self-reflection leads to... There's not a lot of happy in Sam's former life you know and, and and his current life you know he's shipped off to the wall to to prevent him from inheriting horn hill so, and then that goes to well why did my family hate me so much and i'm a coward and all the things that this churns up so yeah i mean it's there, there's not much new there but it is no you know a reminder of just how miserable sam's life has been to this point yeah to this point all we had gotten was the things he told other people right now now we're seeing just how present this self-loathing is in sam's mind yeah how constant it's there and he's clearly bought into the things that his father people people like his father and alistair thorne have said about him to the point where he's just accepted it and resigned himself to the fact that these him being a coward is and him being all the negative things that he thinks that he's been that he has been told he believes are true. Yeah, and, and most of that doesn't necessarily have to be debilitating. But the problem it leads to for Sam is that he can't imagine that anybody else in this company is as scared as he is. Right. But of course they are. They're all exactly as scared as he is. You yeah, know? check Chet's pants. Right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Maslin again. I mean, he saw Maslin just... Throw down his, take off his gloves, throw down his stuff, and just beg for mercy. I mean, obviously he was, 
not exactly the picture of heroic bravery there. No, but I'm I'm going to give anyone who faces the, an army of the undead on the Fist of the First Men a pass for how oh, yep. lacking in I bravery agree. they acted. I agree. I think Sam just thinks he's the only one exactly, that yeah. feels these fears, whereas they all do. Even all the way up to Commander Mormont, they're yeah. feeling these kind of fears yeah. and self-doubt. And in many respects, how the chapter ends is exactly exactly what most soldiers do. They They have the terror when they're in battle that any other soldier has. But when the moment comes, they act because... That's what they've got to do. And, and it right. comes across as bravery for, for most people. It doesn't come across as bravery for Sam because we know him too well. Right. We know it was just sort of like an instinctive reaction. But when someone sort of acts brave, it's the same instinctive reaction. You know, they're trying yep. to save their friends and their own skin, you know. Yep. Well said. Um, yeah, so Sam's job, it's, it's, it's of debatable importance that he gets an accurate retelling of what's going on on the Fist of the First Men. I mean, <laughs> but it is undeniably important that the Night's Watch are aware of this army of the undead coming their way. And he did fail to do that, unfortunately, in, in his panic. I honestly think it's because he kept drafting the message. There was very little reason to keep updating the message. True. We are attacked by White Walkers. That's enough. Stop. End Strap of it message. to a raven. <laughs> send right. it on its way. <laughs> Yeah, that's that. That's true. Yeah, I mean, it. It's like you with the recap. I mean, just like rewrite after rewrite. You know, man, we've got it. It's good. Let's just go with it. Yeah, I mean, the battle was going to be lost regardless. The whites had overpowered their defenses, and the knights watched. The brothers were unprepared for this white attack. So, aside from Melisandre's shadow assassin raining fireballs down on the undead. <laughs> No amount of heroics was going to to have that much of an impact. So, Actually, you know, the fact perhaps perhaps foreshadowing a dragon, a dragon might come in handy. A dragon would have been very handy. Yeah. Yes, I agree. I agree. But you know, so the the goal of getting the news out, the goal of getting this message back to the Shadow Tower in Castle Black, is to prevent a repeat of this disaster, so that Bowen Marsh, who's the Castellan of Castle Black right now, and Dennis Malister, who's the, who commands the Shadow Tower, so that they know what happened, so that the whole thing, so it can be, they can be prepared for a, such an attack. You know what they should do is is write a tersely worded missive to King's Landing, demanding more men because there are White Walkers north of the Wall. I'm sure that will be well received. Yes, fantastic plan. It's basically fail safe, I believe. <laughs> yes. But you know the the whole this whole ranging might have been avoided if um if Benjamin Stark had had a couple of ravens on his ranging so because they came out here to figure out what happened to Waymar Royce and Benjamin Stark and find out what what's going on maybe he just hasn't found out yet <laughs> yeah, I guess <laughs> he's got the raven I imagine R- rangers I'm not going home until I do rangers can't really traips around with uh, ravens they'd probably make a little too much racket maybe and the, the cages would be a little bit of burdensome to true. carry around true but had he had at least one to send back this is what's happening <laughs> then they would know and they wouldn't have to send 300 of their best people north of the wall to mostly be slaughtered yeah so the men start the battle on the fist with um conventional swords and arrows against the whites which seems a bit of a waste of time un- unless you Unless you don't believe the three horn blasts, unless you think it might be wildlings, it seems like a complete waste of time to even try that. You know, you, um, what was the name of the guy they had to to fight in Mormont's chambers? Othor. Othor, yes. Yeah. Um, Othor, they 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 kept poking him with swords, and none of it had any effect, right? Until right. the drapes, they set the... him on fire. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that's when John burned his hand, and so yeah. that's that's how Mormont at least knows. To use fire, that's why he shouts fire arrows, you know, hit them with fire. But I was, as I was reading the chapter, I kept thinking, because of Othar and Jafer Flowers, that was the other white, uh, they know whites exist, so maybe they should have been prepared for a white attack. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, ring the outer ring wall with wood to light in case something like this happened. Yeah, 
they seemed woefully unprepared for it. Yep, I'm, I'm with you actually, Michaela. I, I, I always like to give a counterpoint, but actually, you're, you're quite right. They, they, they should have, even if they were expecting an army of wildlings. They, in the back of Mormont's mind, there should have been the thought that the, the attack might come from others. It seemed like they were just had no idea that this possibility might happen, but they've seen the whites, so they know it's possible, and they're north of the wall, which is where they know the whites come from. Uh, so around 50 survived the fight at the Fist, uh, but those numbers have continued to drop. Um, death from injuries, from wandering off, from shouts and screams from behind, which doesn't sound like right. the best way to go. No. So that means that 250 were lost in the battle, so that's pretty, uh, that's pretty bad news. And many of, survi- many of the survivors don't have horses, so the number of dead horses that um, uh, the wildlings found was indicative of the, uh, the state of this battle. Yeah, although they were basing the deaths off of how many corpses they saw, but um, we just saw another riding a Night's Watch horse, so who knows how many others picked up new horses along the way, you know? <laughs> uh, point of order, do we know it was a Night's Watch horse? Yeah, uh, at the very end of the chapter, Small Paul says that was Molly, Molly's? Oh, he knew the horse. I'd forgotten that. Yeah, he said, why did you hurt that horse? It's Molly's Uh, horse, I think. Something like that, M-E-W-L-E-Y. Small Paul. He'll be missed. I know. he, he, He really had a redemption story here. We'll get to him shortly. But So the Whites broke through the torch efforts on the fist. So I'm wondering... Why is that not happening here during this march? I saw you put this question, and I thought about it a little bit, and, and I think it's because they're marching. I think I think on the fist, they were stationary, and so they had the ring of fire, and that helped, but it's not. it wasn't, like you said, it wasn't a complete ring of fire, and so it couldn't keep right. them out forever, and uh, they're moving. I mean, that's what's keeping them away from the White Walkers and the, and, and the Whites here. The, the ring of flame just sort of reassures a little bit. Yeah, I think may- maybe, maybe. It's just when that other arrived, he didn't seem to arrive with much haste. He just kind of, the horse kind of trotted into the light of the torch. And there was no other others around. When you get a horse whose entrails are hanging out, you got to ride them gently. They got, you got to pace it a little bit. You know, he's got that crystal sword. He could just cut them off. The entrails. They didn't have to let him drag. Just chalk. Just get him get off. Anyway, I was wondering if maybe the others were driving them toward a desired destination. Hey, we want you to go east. So, yeah, we're just going to stay in the periphery. Because it seems like if they wanted to, they could overpower this ring of torches the way they yeah, did. Yeah, I mean, we don't know how fast this army can move. So maybe the maybe they are going fast enough to stay ahead of them. But, yeah, that's... That is a worrying thought, that the Night's Watch are actually doing what the army of the undead want them to do. Yeah, maybe. I I will say, as far as speed, they're going at the pace that Sam Tarly could walk to this point. Oh, yeah. So, not exactly racing. <laughs> Wait for pedantry, yeah, so have some thoughts. <laughs> so, Mormon, uh, when, the, when they sort of take a moment to sort of uh, gather their thoughts, Mormon... Uh, takes most of the men off the horses and redistributes the supplies across the horses, puts the wounded men on the horses and the healthy people have to walk again. Uh, it's a, I mean, it's an honorable strategy. People, you know, to look after the yeah. wounded like that, but it feels like you might want to head a little bit faster and the wounded might have to be sacrificed. Yeah, that's, the kind of, that's part of the issue though, right? Like on one hand, yes, it is honorable to try and save these injured brothers and and not just sacrifice them. But then, on the other hand, you know that many of them won't be able to keep up like Sam. Yeah. And any that are left behind are just going to join the ranks of the yeah. enemy. And So I was thinking, yes, I really, I do appreciate this plan. Me especially, as someone who would try and save every last person out there. But you would think there would be some sort of ride chair situation going on, like enough horses so that men could ride for a few hours, then walk for a few hours, rotate the horses, the men around the riding horses. Well, let me let me be the cold blooded one momentarily. If we just leave the wounded sort of like together, 
with some torches and some arrows and like pick off as many as you can before you succumb. They'll just replace the ones that they take out. <laughs> then I've got a horse for every able-bodied man and I don't need half as many supplies to get us home because we're going to go ten times as fast. Yep. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. But you know, another thing I noticed was there was very little, almost no effort in preventing Sam, Gren, and Paul from falling outside of that ring of fire. You know, like, there was no comment from the rear guard, like, hey, I'm the last, you have to stay in front of me, get, get moving. And maybe Sam would have walked at that point. <laughs> there was a few leave no, I, I think Sam had made his decision at that point. But but yeah, I mean, you've got to imagine that it's like, they're, they're, it's a wasted breath, you know. They know if you fall behind the last torchbearer, then you're outside the ring and you're going to get it. And I, at this point, they must all be utterly exhausted. I guess. But, you know, I, I get it. Maybe, maybe there's not a whole lot of fear from a white Sam, but I'm not sure that I'd want a, any part of a white Gren or a white Paul. That's a good point. Yes. You know, they're, <laughs> they, they, they're not people I want to face on the, the other side of the uh, fence there. Yeah. So... I mean, Gren's a big, strong lad, but he can't help Sam up. It's just too much for him. And uh, but fortunately, Small Paul, who's a, you know giant of a man, is able to get him up and actually carry him, which is really super heroic to to carry Sam and Sam's pack over any kind of distance through snow with drifts up to their knees. Right, and imagine how much more deep you'd go if you were carrying Sam. You know. <laughs> Thankfully, the ground's probably pretty frozen. At, at so. some point, you'll find ground, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Paul. Paul's redemption story. He was part of Chet and Lark's plan for the mutiny, but he was always he was always a bit of a gentle giant who was just you know going along with it. Uh, his role, though, was actually to kill Lord Commander Mormont, which uh, right. was not a good look. Uh, no, but he. he you know, he's he's simple-minded and he didn't really understand the repercussions of what he was saying. So mostly he was doing it because he wanted a talking rave and he thought they were cool. That is mostly what he was doing it for. Yeah. And yes, it, it is quite the redemption story because he tries to save Sam in two ways. He tries to carry Sam, sacrificing his own ability to move forward. And he also charges the other with his axe. It, basically sacrificing his life. Now, maybe he thought he would be able to take the other, but still, he charged at that other with his axe, defending Sam and Gren. Yeah. And, of course, again, seemingly for Raven, because when one of the other brothers says, leave him, he says, he promised me a Raven. And so, you know. But he was <laughs> he was also upset for the at the other for hurting that horse that was... Right. Molly's or whatever his name was. Hey, I think we might have mentioned this in the prologue, but he's got a very Lenny from Mice and Men esque uh, nature about him. He does, and so that makes his death very sad. But you know, like we said, I mean, he's his his actions saved Sam, and maybe have given hope to the realm because uh, now we know there's a way to kill the others. Right. Yes, because nobody's successfully done it with a sword or a flaming arrow yet. But we know someone's now done it with a dragon glass dagger. Yeah, and it not only killed him, but it sort of melted him away, turned him into nothing. To nothing, right? Um, so Sam prays to the mother for mercy, but he, um, of course, he and John took their uh, night's watch for vows in front of the weirwood north of the wall um, to the old gods claiming that the seven the seven gods had never done anything for him. And I will say, actually, if you think back on this story, we've we've seen that sort of various gods around the world have got some powers. I I, I believe in the old gods a little bit. There's there's something something to do with Bran is making me think that they have real power. And certainly uh -huh. Relor, I mean he can do he can do Ma magic, Relor. He, he's he's, got he's like one of those magicians up on stage, you know, like, whoa, watch this. But the seven <laughs> They're like passive statues. They do nothing. Yeah. And that was Sam's argument when he decided to say his vows in front of the werewood to the old gods. But I'm not just saying it for Sam. I mean, like, nobody. I mean, like, nobody's got anything from them. I mean, apart from perhaps the solace of, you know, believing in an afterlife and things like oh, that. Oh, uh, um, Davos. 
Remember, he heard the mother. Oh, Davos heard the mother. That's right. You know what? He was pretty fevered at the time. He was. (laughs) He was. But did you notice how Sam reverts back to the seven here in this crisis situation? Right. Yeah. yeah. So, it, you know, it's, I guess, old habits. You know, he grew up in the in the seven. So, um, you know, he reverts back to them. But but then he also, on the other hand, acknowledges that the seven are powerless north of the wall. This is where the old gods have uh, it, dominion. Dominion. Yes, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah. So the whole chapter sort of like builds up to this sort of like incredibly consequential moment where Sam kills the other, but we don't actually see him until the very last chap- page of the chapter. It's right at the end that it, that he appears. Yeah. Um, it's a great build up. You know, it, during the battle especially, you hear Sam uh you hear Sam hears his brothers calling out, you know, the approach of the enemy. The, the, then they're talking about, oh my, there's more coming. Look, they're coming out of the forest now. And then you see that the the traditional weaponry is ineffective entirely. And he still can't see what's going on out there. And then the he starts, they start to kind of trickle in over the wall, the whites do. And then this undead bear breaches the wall and decapitates Thorin Smallwood. And then finally they're He's he's part of this spearhead riding down the slope and he's fully immersed in these whites pulling him everywhere, you know, pulling on horses and people. And and then that ends. And then you think, you know, they've they've escaped all that kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden they find themselves alone. And sure enough, we see an other for the first time since the prologue of a Game of Thrones. It was just it was it was really a great job of building the the tension and the suspense. I, I will say some of it was by by being intentionally boring because I mean there was a lot of trudging through the snow in this chapter. You know, <laughs> so like he, he cried, he took another step, he cried. I'm like, get on with it. There was a lot of crying and walking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sam stabs the other with the dragon glass dagger, and the uh, other melts and you know melts literally to nothing. It just and then the dagger is there and. While the the dagger is in the other, there's a line that says, "Where its fingers touch the obsidian, the dagger they smoked." And at first, I th- I was thinking, "Hmm, that could possibly where be where obsidian gets the nickname dragon glass from because it makes others smoke when it touches them." But I I googled obsidian to see wh- what obsidian was made of, and really, obsidian is a volcanic glass formed when Volcanic lava cools rapidly with minimal crystal growth. That was from Wikipedia. So the fact that it comes from lava probably has more to do with dragon glass than smoking others. But <laughs> I feel like we might have said all that before, but you know, what do I know? Did did we? Do we talk about obsidian? I got a horrible memory, so don't trust me. Well, I will say though, it's a good thing Sam didn't discard his heavy pack, even if it was primarily due to the garlic sausage that he had <laughs> stored in it <laughs> remember he packed the dragon glass in his pack and he and the horn and his extra small clothes i counted 10 layers of clothes on sam when he was describing everything he was wearing so you know keeping that pack around really helped out but ultimately it helped out most because he had the dragon glass yes. dagger there so do you have some background for us mckelly I do. There wasn't a great deal to go off of here, so I thought I'd focus on Sir Otten Withers. We lost him here on the fist, not to a white like so many others, but instead to a horse kick in the face. <laughs> Maybe it's best for the tough old guy, as at roughly 70 years old, he might have had trouble on that forced march as Sam did. Uh, he had been tasked with commanding the rear guard of this ranging and was not in favor of the idea of attacking the wildling host when Thor and Smallwood brought back the news of the host's position and makeup. He preferred that they retreat from the significantly larger force to, well, the safety of the wall. He said, we're the shields that guard the realms of men. Our shield, 700-foot shield, is that way. We should probably go there. Anyway, uh... And Sir Otten was second in command on the ranging, and actually Chet's mutiny plan involved killing Lord Commander Mormont, which would have left 
Sir Otten in charge, and Chet and his co-conspirators felt Sir Otten wouldn't bother to pursue the men because he was just wanting to get out of town, to get back south of the wall. So, Sir Otten is from House Withers in the Reach. There's not a whole lot to go on here. That's why I gave you all that background on <laughs> Sir Otten that we kind of already knew, but I just wanted to remind everybody who we are dealing with. It is believed that their sigil is a gray squirrel on white with a red border, and their words are not known. The The only other known member of House Withers is Sir Willem Withers, who is the captain of Marjorie Tyrell's guard. Do we have any idea of the relationship between Otten and Willem? We do not. Okay. Well, thank you anyway. I appreciate it. I don't even know where their seat is or what it's called or anything. So, comparison with the television show. Uh, so, there's quite a lot happens in the chapter. If you think about the whole flashback, we, this covers quite a bit of time. So, I had to piece sure. together quite a few scenes from the TV show. In the show, Sam gets lost near the Fist of the First Men when the horns blast. So he's not on the fist. The horns blast. Uh, Gren and Ed run run off to help, and Sam gets lost. and And basically, as the others arrive, kind of the weather comes in, and he can't he can't see anything. Perhaps sensing how useless he is, they ignore him, even though they see him. They just walk past him and leave him be. <laughs> <laughs> That's not helping his self esteem any. <laughs> <laughs> and and that was how season two ended. And then season three opened with Sam heading back to the Fist of the First Men, seeing dead brothers of the Night's Watch, you know, decapitated and things, and then getting attacked by a stray white who obviously had got lost from the army. Uh, and then he's saved by Ghost. Oh. Which is genuinely confusing because John isn't there. <laughs> So in the TV show, I think there was basically this sort of sundering of John. When John was with Mance's army, Ghost wasn't with him in the TV show. Okay. Um, ah. And also Lord Commander Mormont. In fact, Ghost just drags the white away and Lord Commander Mormont sets it on fire. Lord Commander Mormont has the 50 survivors with him and they, he asks him if he sent the ravens and Sam in the TV show didn't even send the ravens, never mind the messages. So he's like... Mm. No. And <laughs> Mormont's mad that he's failed in his one mission. You had one uh, job! So the battered remnants of the Great Ranging start their long march home. Now, Sam does kill a white... I mean, you couldn't miss this bit out of the TV show. Sam does kill a white walker, but that's in a much later scene with quite a lot of spoilery in it, so I can't reveal that, but he does do it. In fact, it's the one who eyes him when he walks past him on the way to the battle. Oh. Or at least he looks the same. I mean, maybe they all look exactly the same, but it... Sam said, that'll teach you to overlook me. Exactly. You should have killed me when you had the chance. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I'm an overweight coward? <laughs> all right. Pedantry Corner. Well, I'll just bring up, which I think, I think everyone who reads this chapter would think. I don't know how long you think you would have lasted on this forced march, McKelly. Like, if I had, like top-notch winter gear, lightweight but really warm, and I was carrying nothing, I think I could have gone about an hour and I would have collapsed. <laughs> like, I'm done. <laughs> I'm like, joining the Army of the Undead is better than taking another step. Happily, Happy to do it. But it feels like Sam, who is colossally overweight, carrying a huge pack, dressed in heavy, heavy furs, has done it for days, it seems. Yes. The pace must be, like you said, snail pace. Which is why I kept wondering, well, how they were staying ahead of the others. And unless they too were like, ooh, that was a long fight. The thing is, I I think the whole thing needs to be incredibly cold and therefore they're just sort of on ice and so they're not trudging into the snow and downhill so they can slide some of the way. So Okay. You know, yeah, I like it. This I like would it. be <laughs> so that's that's my pedantry. I, it's not big pedantry, but it is. It just feels like you could not keep this pace up, and eventually he doesn't. But maybe that's the thing. Maybe this was all real time. Maybe every time he said it took a step, that was actually one of the steps he took. <laughs> so. he only took like twenty steps. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's why the others hadn't attacked him yet. They were still <laughs> behind them. They were only about <laughs> five hundred feet away from. <laughs> We'll get to them in a second. <laughs> you had one? My bit of pedantry was just 
So Sam mentions walking to the, as he puts it, the huge fire at the center of camp. And I kept thinking when he would mention this huge fire, it's the same huge fire at the center of camp on the tallest hill in the area that no wildling scout noticed. I just don't. I'm not sure I buy that. Okay. Uh, just do, do we do we know for a fact this fire was lit prior to the battle? Because it is possible. I'm just I don't know if I'm wrong in saying this, but it is possible that they were like, they might. I heard three blasts. Let's light a big fire. So we've got a fire. I, I guess that's theoretically possible, but they were cooking. They had cook fires oh, yeah. and I plenty mean, of cook fires going on up there. We've mentioned this a couple of times and it, it is, it is, the whole thing is kind of implausible. Let's, let's take 300 men to secretly track a, an army and let's put them on the highest point and light some fires. It's like, that's not the way to do it. Right. That feels like you're distracting from what you're really up to, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just put a fire up there. Really? We're going to go around the other way. <laughs> News and notes. Well, so news and notes, about exactly a year ago, we told you about the Folio Society releasing their beautiful tomb volume version of A Feast for Crows. Well, they're at it again. Now they've released A Dance with Dragons. Just like its predecessors, A Dance with Dragons is two volumes. Both volumes have five full-page color illustrations, two double-page illustrations, and color illustrations inside the slipcases, all from the talented artist Jonathan Burton. Uh, you'll also find illustrated chapter openings, house sigils, and volume two includes 12 family trees. But again, just like last year, this is not cheap at 230 US dollars. But Ouchie. Yeah, with the holiday season fast, fast approaching, you know? Yeah. I mean, you, if you want to go a little bit lower, ghosts of Harrenhal.threadless.com. <laughs> yes. Now, that's a good idea right there. <laughs> and so we got a review on podchaser.com by uh, someone called Lucas, like my son. Um, uh -huh. Having been bitten by a Song of Ice and Fire fever again after the first episode of House of the Dragon... I totally understand, by the way. And wanting to brush up on my knowledge a bit, I came across the Ghosts of Harren Hall in my search for a chapter-by-chapter -chapter book recap podcast. I mean, come Perfect. on. That's what we are. <laughs> I've been that listening is. to almost nothing but the voices of Simon and Kelly in my spare time for the past month. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, Lucas. <laughs> sounds... Definitely not your Lucas writing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he would listen to you, maybe. <laughs> As they brought me back to the Westeros chapter by chapter and reignited my love for this world. I love the structure of each episode and I'm always interested in the background of each chapter as well as the comparison to the television show. I last read the books a good 10 years ago, so a lot of the TV show and the books are mixed in my memory. Oh, me too, Lucas, me too. The podcast has been very helpful in untangling that memory. <laughs> I wish that were true of me. And will also hopefully continue to be with me until Dream of Spring. Best regards from Germany. Well, thank you, Lucas. And once again, can I just say, anybody who listens to us in a, not their native language. I mean, sometimes when I listen back, I'm like, what is that guy saying? <laughs> and it's you. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not you. you. You have very good diction, McKelly. It's me. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much, Lucas. This made, this put quite the smile on my face yeah, when I came really across it. Review. Thank you. So let's conclude. So White Walkers are not indestructible. Woo, that's good to know. And even Sam can do it. Yeah, and, and you know, this is the enemy the Night's Watch was formed to defend against, uh, for the defend the realm against. Right, right. The wildlings are just a cover story. You don't need a 700-foot wall to keep the wildlings out. Right, yeah. But I have to say, round one, a decisive victory for the White Walkers. <laughs> so... <laughs> But I don't know, right at, right at the bell, Sam landed a punch. <laughs> he did. Good point. He did land a punch right at the bell. I, I guess um they're a little rusty. It's been a few yes. 8,000 years since they've last really had to battle these others. But it seemed like they were just surprisingly unprepared for the fight, the Night's Watch, that is. But, you know, they, they did give up their biggest asset, which is the wall. Yeah, they did. You know, they 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 met them on the the others' territory, but even even with that, 
they knew that White Walkers were out there. They had two in Castle Black. They should have been a little more prepared, I feel like. Yep. Um, so the Great Ranging is in big trouble. The others seem like they could overtake them at any time and it's an awful long haul back to castle black so um will any of them make it fingers crossed we yeah. have a new pov character but that doesn't that is not indestructible armor either ned stark no ned stark <laughs> yeah uh we have to hope uh, a few of them make it back because sam never got those messages off about the white walker attack so you'd have to imagine uh when when the message reaches Castle Black that we're under attack, they will assume it was wildlings unless they specifically get notified, oh no, they were whites and others. Yeah. We need to prepare for that kind of attack. Yeah. But, you know, uh, the White Walkers, why were they so focused on these few hundred Night's Watch when there is a wildling host of tens of thousands not too far away? What was it about the Night's Watch? Just that they were a new toy to play with? That really big fire attracted the eye. <laughs> yeah, you'd think that might scare them away a little bit. <laughs> I'm not going up there. <laughs> I, I will say, actually, bringing that up, actually, it does make me think, is there, a, is there a plan here? Because if there's a threat to the Seven Kingdoms, it is the, the others getting south of the wall. Well, uh-huh. destroying the Night's Watch would help. So yes. perhaps this is not just random. and Perhaps it's not just let's pick off the easy prey. This is let's go after those guys because it's going to make our long-term job much easier. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, whites might be mindless zombie-like creatures, but others seem to be intelligent, sentient beings. Yeah. So they might, you're right, they might have a plan. That, no, those, those 300 up there are going to be much more useful to knock off right. than that wildling host. Right. We'll take care of them some other time. Yeah, that's possible. Next week, we're off to uh, King's Landing for a Tyrion chapter where his dad gives him some very noteworthy news. Okay. Well, there's three ways that you can help us. You could leave us a review like Lucas did. Um, you could buy some merchandise at ghostsofharrenhall.threadless.com. You could buy us a cup of Arbor Gold at buymeacoffee.com slash ghostsharrenhall. Uh, even become a sustainer at the Lord Paramount or Knight of the Realm level. Uh, you'll get your episodes a day early and ad-free and other good benefits beside. That's right. And as always, of course, you can reach us at ghost.heronhall at gmail.com. You can go out and follow us on Twitter at Ghost Heron Hall or on Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.